a fresh breeze in our sails. I love the image that that creates. So often we feel that we're at the end of ourselves. But with God, there's always another corner to turn. There's always that fresh breeze that will fill our sails and push us beyond wherever we thought we could go. On Good Friday, we asked a question. And the question was, what is the meaning of the cross? That's a real controversial question. But we wanted to emphasize that whatever we think of the cross, the most important thing is summed up when Jesus said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Because in that, we see that the cross is about the absolute, ultimate expression of perfect love in human form. That Jesus, at that moment, in his extremis, he still did not resort to any kind of vindictive thoughts, behavior, words. He did not seek revenge. He stayed vulnerable. He stayed open. He stayed connected to the very end. He stayed caring about those who were killing him and mocking him and denigrating him. That kind of love. What can we say about that kind of love? It is so alien to us, so foreign to us. It is so hard for us as human beings to comprehend that that kind of love can exist. But that's what the cross shows us. It shows us that love. And that kind of love does not end. It can't end. It is as eternal as our God in heaven. And so this morning, as we celebrate that continued life and that continued love, there's a couple other questions that we need to ask. What is the meaning of the resurrection? If we're going to talk about what the meaning of the cross was, well, what's the meaning of the resurrection? Well, that's sort of simple, isn't it? Don't you think? I mean, it seems so. It's a, the, the physical rising of Jesus after he died the third day that he was risen, that Jesus, as the Son of God, had the power over death. And because of that, he also had the power to save and resurrect us as part of humanity. But as simple as that may sound, if we get outside of our own bubble of how we were taught as children and the way we were taught throughout, there's a big wide world of Christendom out there. And this also is a controversial subject and you wouldn't think so maybe, but it is. Sincere, loving Christians disagree wildly about the answer to these questions, the meaning of the cross and the meaning of the resurrection, which are the two central focus points of Christianity. But there's a lot of controversy. Christians are all over the map as they search the scriptures, as they search their hearts, as they try to make sense of what it is that we are celebrating here, what it is that's at issue in our faith. Now, of course, most Christians agree that Jesus is alive, but they can't agree on how. How is Jesus alive? Ultimately, it's a matter of faith. We can't know the mechanics of what happened on that first Sunday. But where do we look for guidance? Where can we look? Fortunately, scripture, sh scripture shows us. Scripture shows us where to look. Now, of course, we as humans, we want to focus on the miracle, don't we? We want to focus on the spectacular event. And we want to fight and debate about all the different ways that this could have possibly happened and what it means. But the truth is that we can never prove historically, we can never prove empirically what happened in that tomb. It is a matter of faith. Was then for Jesus' first followers, then it still is for us now. But once again, the scripture comes to our rescue. Once again, the gospels show us where to look. The gospels show us what's important, what to see. What's the main takeaway of the Easter story in the gospels? I want you to notice something. The gospels, the story in the gospels, focus on the effect of the resurrection, the effect of the resurrection on the followers and not the resurrection event itself. Have you thought about that? The focus is on the effect, not on the event itself. And there's a huge distinction to be made here. And this makes us crazy, by the way, because we want to know what happened in that tomb. We want to know the details. We want to know the mechanics. We want to know with certainty what's going on. And we get none of those details. The resurrection happens off stage. 
And then the story picks up after the resurrection and follows Jesus' friends through their experiences of what happened. I know some of you are watching The Chosen, right? And you love that show. Well, the whole deal with The Chosen is it's following Jesus' friends. It's following his followers and the effect that Jesus has on them and on their lives. And it explores their personal lives to see how everything is changing and everything's in turmoil and everything's going all these different ways because of this central figure in their lives. But the story follows the followers, not Jesus. All these tiny, little, unspectacular events and responses are what the Gospels are looking at when we look at the resurrection story and everything that happens afterwards. So the story itself tells us where to look. Not at the miracle, but how the miracle affects our lives. How it affected those first lives and by extension how it's going to affect ours as well. Because the question that we should be asking ourselves isn't whether we believe the miracle of the resurrection, but what difference it makes that we believe. What difference does it make in our lives? And so what can Jesus' friends' reactions teach us about ourselves, about where we're going in our faith journeys? I find it absolutely fascinating and so instructive and <laughs> enlightening and insightful and add your adjective there, that no one recognizes the risen Jesus the first time that they see him. Nobody recognizes him. Do you think that's an important detail? You know, the Gospels are really short. Short little books. We would want a lot more, but they're short. There's absolutely no wasted words in the Gospels. Remember the line from Mark Twain? You know, if I had more time, I would have written a shorter book. <laughs> It's hard to write short, really hard to write short. Every word has to be there for a purpose, for an absolute reason. Every detail of the Gospels is there on purpose. It's showing something that's really important. What is that thing? How in the world did they not recognize Jesus? How could this possibly be? Especially with all the preparation he was giving them, he was telling them he was going to come back. And they see him and they don't recognize him. Now, we're going to wonder, of course, because we're going to wonder about the mechanics again, right? We want to know how. How did this happen? Did Jesus look somehow different after the resurrection so that they didn't recognize him? Was he hiding himself for some sort of reason? But as long as we're thinking along those lines, we're missing the point. Because the point is that these details are not about Jesus. They're about his followers, and their reactions to him, and us, and our reactions. What the Gospels are showing us is that seeing the risen Jesus is a process, not just an event. It's a process. It's the process of becoming ready to see the impossible. Now, this is not to say that there was no event, that there was no physical resurrection, but it is to say that this process, this interior process that the followers are going through, that we are going through, overrides the event. If you haven't gone through the process, you're not going to be able to see what actually happened because this process is about taking us beyond physical seeing. It's a spiritual process of becoming absolutely ready to see something that you never thought could possibly happen to break down the programming in your minds that is so strong it only allows us to see what we think we already know, to break that down and to grow new eyes and to see something completely different. And this process, of course, is always going to be based on intimacy. I love Psalm 138. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Notice the verbs, taste and see that the Lord is good. Not sit and think. Taste and see. What happens if you taste something? That's about the most intimate thing you can do. Put something in your mouth and taste it. How much more intimate, how much more connected does it get than that? Taste and see. 
We can't do this by remote control. We can't do this from a distance. It has to happen right here and right now. To be engaged over time with that kind of intimate connection is the process of being able to see what is really in front of us and not what we think we already know. Now, the followers' first reactions are really instructive if you think about it. And then we got Mary. Got to love Mary. She shows up at the tomb, and she sees the empty tomb, and she doesn't understand what the heck's going on. You know, the men are running off, and they're doing their own thing, and she's left just there, vulnerable, and just in her intimate connection with Jesus, just staying there. And she comes out of the tomb, and she's just weeping, sobbing uncontrollably. And she sees someone there, and she's kind of taken aback. And he says, why are you weeping? She says, well, someone has taken my Lord, and I don't know where they put him. And she has no idea who she's speaking to. She thinks he's the gardener. And so she says, if you know where he is, if you have taken him someplace, let me know. Now, you can see her putting her foot down at this point because she's a firebrand. Yeah. <laughs> and he just says, Mary. He says, Miriam. And immediately it clicks in. Immediately she knows the sound of his voice the tone that he used that she heard thousands of times before in her time with Jesus clicks in and she says, Rabuni, which means rabbi, teacher, master. Jesus' next line is classic. He says, stop clinging to me. Don't you love the economy of words there? The Gospels don't have to say that she ran to him and she threw herself on him. And, you know, and in that culture, she would have fallen to the ground, thrown herself at his feet and wrapped her arms around his ankles and kissed his feet. That would have been the way that someone in Mary's position would have greeted her master. We don't get any of that. Stop clinging to me. You fill in the rest. That intimacy was going to change now. It wasn't going to be the way it was, but it was going to be just as close and just connected. But it was that intimate detail, his voice, her name, that kicked her in. Later that day, there's a group of men, or a couple of men at least, that are walking seven miles out of Jerusalem to go to Emmaus. And along the road, someone comes up and starts traveling with them and asks them, what are you guys talking about? And he says, you don't know. Are you the only one in Israel who doesn't know what happened these last few days? And they tell them everything that happened through Good Friday and the crucifixion. And uh, as they're talking to this man and they finally get to uh, Emmaus, he acts like he's going to keep on going. But they say, hey, it's almost, it's almost dinner. It's almost lunch. No, it's almost nighttime. It's almost something. Anyway, stay with us. You know, stay the night with us. And so Jesus is persuaded and he goes in. And as they sit down to the meal, actually, they wouldn't sit down. They would lie down to the meal. And Jesus takes the bread and he breaks it and he passes it out. And at that moment, they realize who it is. That, again, that intimate gesture, that detail that they had seen him do hundreds of times at their meals breaks the spell, breaks them through into a, no, a new kind of seeing, a new knowing. Even later than that, Peter says he's just going to go back fishing. This is back at the Galilee. And they go out fishing. They're fishing all night, and they catch nothing. This is a story that Bill read. And so someone yells out at the, from the beach, Hey, are you catching anything? Kind of insulting when you think about it. No, not a thing. Well, why don't you try putting your nets on the other side of the boat? Sometimes there are things that are just so absurd, you know. You just kind of shrug, and for whatever reason, they did it, and they're hauling in this huge catch. And at that moment, they realize who it was on the beach. And Peter, being Peter, throws off his mantle and jumps in the water, can't wait for the boat to go to shore, swims all the way to the sand. And where is Jesus doing there? He's sitting on his heels in the sand, and he's cooking breakfast, cooking fish over an open fire on the beach. Small, intimate details that break the spell, break them through, break them through what they had already closed their minds around to see something absolutely impossible, to see something miraculous, to see something different, to see that their hopes were still alive. Each encounter... It's the smallest, most intimate gesture that breaks that spell. It's like those silly ID questions that you get asked online. You know, what was your mother's maiden name? What was your third pet's, you know, name? You know, what was the school? Those kind of details, nobody's going to know. They are not spectacular. They're not on your resume, right? Nobody cares about that stuff. 
but that tells you who you are. Or like those movies where you're trying to prove your identity. Hey, where did we have dinner on that third Sunday that we met? You know, and, and you can tell them. Those are the kinds of details that prove identity. These are the details that are breaking through these followers' reverie to be able to see the risen Jesus. The Gospels are showing Jesus' friends in the process of re-experiencing this intimacy with him, proving his identity to them. And it's going to be exactly the same with us in most intimate details of our lives and relationships is where we're going to find the risen Lord. Not a thought or a concept in our head, not a doctrine or a theological principle from 2,000 years ago or 500 years ago. It's going to be in the details of our lives where this comes clear. It's going to be our own process of letting our intimate experience in our own moments convince us somewhere beyond the intellect and take us all the way to trust. Because without trust, nothing happens. Without trust, there is no change. There is no transformation. So that brings us to the second question. If you're convinced that Jesus lives, if you're convinced that Jesus is not dead, where are you going to look for him? Again, the Gospels are going to tell us where to look. Read them. At Luke 24, one of the best lines in the whole New Testament, why do you seek the living among the dead? I love that line. Here they are looking for Jesus where they left him, fully expecting him to be there. You know, when you leave a dead person somewhere, chances are when you come back, they're going to be right where you left them. So of course they're going to go back there. Why do you seek the living among the dead? It's the central clue to how we and anybody can see the risen Jesus. You know, I used to think that if I could have walked with Jesus for those three years, four years, whatever it happened to be with the followers, I would have had a leg up. I wouldn't have missed him when I saw him for the first time as the risen Lord. Really? <laughs> it's so easy to say that and not live it. I spent a decade looking for Jesus. I looked everywhere I thought that he should be. I looked in church, I looked in religion, I looked in theology, I looked in Bible, I looked in books. That's where I was looking for Jesus, trying to find this authentic, real Jesus. But I was always looking where I expected him to be, in my beliefs, in my ideas, in my thoughts. And guess what? He wasn't there. He wasn't there any more than he was in that graveyard. Because the moment that we settle on a belief, the moment that we settle on an idea about God, the moment that we think we're certain about something, he's not there. Why? Life and spirit are defined by motion. The word ruha means breath, wind, spirit, all at the same time, all defined by motion. If there's no motion, there's no breath, there's no life. If there's motion, no motion, there's no wind. It's just air. If there's no motion, there's no spirit. They're defined by motion. Living things move. If there's no motion, there's no life. Set belief in your head is static. It's motionless. It's dead. It's no longer among the living. Jesus is not there. As soon as we think a thought, we have taken a snapshot of the motion of life. It's moved on. We're stuck here with the image. Jesus is not there. The Gospels are showing us where to look for the risen Jesus in the heart of everyday life, in the heart of all of our details, in the heart of all of our experiences, no matter how small. Because if we can't find Jesus here in the miracle of this new life now, then we have missed the meaning of resurrection entirely. What do you think it felt like for Jesus' friends to experience the resurrection? Again, the Gospels imply, the Gospels show us, it must have felt like coming home. Don't you think? Intimate, familiar, but wildly changed at the same time. After all, he could walk through walls now. 
He could pop in and out of appearance. But still, it was him. He ate with them. He could touch them. They knew him. And until the resurrection became that intimate to his followers, it didn't exist for them. It wasn't real for them. They couldn't recognize him. They couldn't see him. Because resurrection is not an idea or a concept. It is an intimate experience. When a loved one calls your name, doesn't everything in you respond? Doesn't it feel like you're home when you hear that sound? There's nothing more spectacular than the unspectacular moment of just hearing your name called by someone you love and love to be with and feel at peace and home with. And when a simple gesture of breaking or sharing food just disarms us, opens us up, that is the passage to trust. Now we are moving to trust. Jesus is always among the living. He's always among each detail of our relationships. As soon as we decide where he's supposed to be, he's not there anymore. And we will miss him. We will miss the hour of our visitation, as he said. The irony is that we're always looking for Jesus in the clouds, looking for him to come back on a horse, on a this, on a that. Where is Jesus? He's sitting on his heels in the sand and cooking fish for breakfast. Look in your own kitchen. Who's cooking your breakfast? Look in the details of your life if you want to find the risen Lord. That's where you're going to find him. His friends couldn't see that he had risen until they saw him in every single detail of their lives. And neither will we. Because it's not what you believe. It's what difference it makes that you believe. We're going to find Jesus in the face and embrace of every moment of our lives, or we're not going to find him at all, no matter what we say we believe about our doctrine. Because Jesus is always in motion, our motion, among the living. Guess what? That's us. We're the living. <laughs> Look for him here. Look for him in your lives. Find that connection that shows you the miracle of continued life in the love that our Father has to give us. That will take you to the meaning of the resurrection like a laser.